Good evening, Hope Reform Baptist Church. Open your Bibles up to Judges chapter 10. We find ourselves in a dark day in Israel's history, but there is some shining light. And our passage was, uh, uh, our sermon is around the idea of uh, influential minors, uh, not because they are young, but because they are the minor judges. These are the guys who we really only have a, a couple of verses to their name to tell us about their life. These are the nobodies of the book of Judges. And by God's grace, we will learn what God can do with a bunch of nobodies. Look at chapter 10. We will be looking through uh, uh, the first first part of chapter 10, as well as a portion in chapter 12, which covers in these brief few verses, the life and ministry of Tola and Jer, as well as Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. Amen. So, no, that's another name of a man, is Ahmed. No, I'm just kidding. So we're in uh, uh, Judges chapter 10. Look first, before we get to these people, look at verse 6 of chapter 10. This is after this, if we're going back in time a little bit, we have chopped around. Uh, Craig preached on the life, the terrible ministry, the horrible leadership of Abimelech and his, his uh, uh, civil war inducing tyrannic life. I'm getting there. Thank you for your patience. And how he, as the son of Gideon, uh, who had a tremendous life, although veered off towards his latter days, uh, his son rose up, killed his other brothers, and, and uh, worked together with the useless crew of Shechem and began a civil war. After that, there is Tola and Jer. Now, we're going to see what happens in the middle of chapter 10 just here in verse 6. This is a very very bad day for Israel. It's a bad day in Israel's history when you say, which other God are they worshipping now? That's an insufficient question. It's multiple other nations' gods at this point in their history. Chapter 10 and verse 6. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines, a smorgasbord of spiritual adultery and whoredom. Verse uh, 6 goes on, And they forsook the Lord, and they did not serve Him. They started with tolerance, we'll add gods to our one God, and then look, lo and behold, before long they had entirely abandoned Yahweh. Verse 7, So the anger of the Lord was kindled, do you think? It was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the Ammonites, and they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year. And for 18 years, that oppression continued. Their evil adultery of spiritual covenant, their breaking off of their spiritual marriage with God, their whoring after other, other gods and their practices and their commandments and their uh, uh, religion got the double-handed punishment of God that two, both the Ammonites and the Philistines came and crushed and pressed down in Israel. Now, they then, in verse 11, they go to God. They return to Him. And you know the cycle. They repent. God forgives them and saves them. Let's see how it happens. Verse 11. And the Lord said to the people of Israel, when they cried out to Him, the Lord said, Did I not save you? <laughs> Haven't we been here before? God's not going to be gaslit, right? I, you said sorry. I know what sorry looks like and smells like, and you're still wearing your girlfriend's jewelry. Did I not save you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the Ammonites and from the Philistines? Oh, the Sidonians also and the Amalekites and the Moanites oppressed you, and you cried out to me, what I do? I saved you out of their hand, yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will save you no more. Go on, cry out to your other gods. <laughs> Been worshiping them for, for, for a couple of decades now. They, they're, your, they're your girlfriends, your harlots, your affairs, your beautiful gods that you've chased after over the hills with and taken your shirts off for. Those gods are your gods. Why aren't you crying out to them? Oh, are they useless, horrible, demonic, fake gods? Is that the problem? Then why are you worshiping them? Look at what he says in verse 14. Go and cry out to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress. And the people of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day. But in verse 14, we look back at this uh, horrible, sorry, verse 13. Therefore, I will save you no more. This is a dire warning 
against not just false repentance, but just a whole approach to the Christian life and worship and religion under the one true Christian God. Uh, This is a warning against vending machine theology, vending machine religiosity. Gee, I'd really like some blessing in this area of my life now. God isn't going to ask. I mean, when you go to a vending machine, it doesn't ask what other debts you have, what other creditors uh, uh, have, have lended money to you. It doesn't ask your income or anything like that. It just asks, do you put in a couple of gold coins of, I'm really sorry, Sky Daddy. I promise I won't do it again. Fingers crossed. In go the coins and out come the blessings. This approach to vending machine theology is warned starkly against in this here text, showing God sees our hearts. And even if we think we're genuine, God knows the future. Religion's a very easy game sometimes, people think. Yahweh is a great teammate. You get down in the dumps, you hit X a couple of times, and your teammate comes and respawns you. It's very easy. We're a gambling addict, and God is the soft-going father. Ring, ring, dad, I know it's late. I'm so sorry. You need to wire me more money. I, I sweat. My odds are getting really good. Okay, son. As long as you know that I love you. Oh, darling, isn't it great that our dear son still calls us for help instead of some other man? He really loves us. This is not our relationship with Yahweh. This is the kind of relationship that God, by passages like this in Scripture, refuses to be known and related to, like. God is not merely a bomb shelter that we run to when things are going bad, keep ourselves safe, and then jump out when the sun is shining again. God says here in this passage, I will save you no more. Yet, we must acknowledge that on the east side or on the right-hand side of the book of Judges chapter 10, there's a lot more biblical history. And if God did not save the Israelites anymore, then they would have been destroyed and consumed, and there wouldn't have been such a thing as the prophets and the chronicles of the kings and then uh, the, the, the exile and then the return from the exile and more prophets and then the coming of the Messiah and the church and the new covenant age. So, so what is this doing here? If God has said, I will save you no more, why is there the rest of biblical history? Why is there so much Bible if that should have been the full stop to all of redemptive history? And and God has said a phrase like this genuinely to his people, I will save you no more, not merely as a a, a passionate off-the-cuff remark, but as a genuine threat to them that you can expect nothing of me. You have ruined our covenant that you have agreed to fulfill, therefore you can ask and demand nothing of me. However, however, there is mercy in God for the sake of his covenant promises that he made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Abraham to Isaac, and then his son Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. God had promised that the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham's grandsons, would be the line that brought the Savior into the world that through them all of the families of the earth would be blessed. Therefore, God, by his own covenant, not because the people get to keep on throwing in the I'm sorry dimes and having his blessings rush out like tickets or dollars or poker chips, not because they have that relationship with him, but because he has that relationship with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, that Jesus tells us in the Gospels are in his presence as he's speaking to those in the days of the judges. He looks to those who are, who are uh, covenant members of the promises that he has made and for their sake, remembering the promise made to them, he gives blessings and mercies to Israel. God had promised, so he will fulfill. So Malachi, the last, the last prophet to come to Israel before 400 years of silence, which would be broken by John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. The last prophet said to Israel, the Lord does not change. The Lord your God does not change. Therefore, you are not consumed. It was true at the end of the Old Testament. It's true here, now at the beginning of their national history in the book of Judges. The only reason they are not consumed is because God has mercy, because God has a mission to accomplish. That is the only reason that they are not consumed. 
What we find in tonight's passages in chapter 10 and chapter 12 is that this mission of God includes absolute nobodies. So look at, look at the story of Tola. It's, it's just a couple of verses. The story of Tola. We're introduced to Tola, Jer, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. These are the minor judges. We have so little about them. These are the nobodies that God's glorious mission to mercifully send a savior through Israel's line, Jesus the Messiah. These are the sorts of nobodies that God's mission includes. After Abimelech, there arose to save Israel. This is chapter 10, verse 1. Arose to save Israel, Tola. All right, cool name, dude. At least he had, his dad and his grandfather have cool names. The son of Pua, son of Dodo. Uh, not really. Okay, moving on. A man of Ishakar, and he lived at Shamia in the hill country of Ephraim. And he judged Israel 23 years. Then he died and was buried at Shamia. Buried where he grew up, sort of a one-town guy. That's all we have. But after the mess of the administration that Abimelech left behind, the towns are all in flames. The halls of justice are deserted. The old books of the, of the uh, uh, constitution and the law codes, they're all just dusty at this point. The, 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 the feasting halls are entirely empty. The gathering halls for worship are deserted. This is the kind of state that Abimelech left the country in after a bloodied massacre and civil war. And there arose Tola. In a dark, dark day for Israel's history, there God rose up this faithful man, Tola. And what a mess he had to deal with. It seems that though Israel, through Gideon, and uh, though Israel had thwarted Midian, they'd thrown off the influence of Midian so that they would not be conquered, and yet they ended up, through their own success and distraction, they ended up thwarting themselves. Civil war run amok and ruined the country and left them what would have been defenseless had God not risen up Tola. He inherited an absolute mess. He labored valiantly, constantly, and we don't know details. We don't know exactly how he did. We don't know his sins. It seems to be the pattern that the more we read about a person, the more of their sins we know. I think Tull is probably reading Jephthah's story and Gideon's story and saying, I'm glad I got two verses. You can't detail all of my mess ups in two verses. I'll take two verses and be a shining hero. A little bit of hagiography here. He's just the uh, upstanding, upright guy. Didn't do anything wrong, but he died. Of course, he had his own failures, but they're not, limited. They're not listed here. Uh, maybe there was twistings in the religious purity to Yahweh, but they're not listed here. They weren't significant enough that he derailed the, the flow of, of Israel's peace. We're not told that they had abject and absolute peace on all sides, which we're told in other, other generations of the judges. But we, we at least see that he judged. He was doing what, and, and, then, and then after him, as Jair rose up, there was a nation to judge. So, so he did a good enough job that Israel was protected. It was uh, kept from being entirely conquered. There's no mention of idolatry or evil alliances or civil war. How did he do it? Was he a statesman mastering the craft of politicizing and unifying people through legislation? Was he a preacher bringing people back into a right knowledge of God as Moses had made him known? Was he a military leader, replenishing the forces, sharpening all the swords, and then making sure they stayed pointed at the other nations, not at themselves? We don't know. We don't know what he did, but God knows. And he included, God included Tola here in this story for our benefit. Because the, the point of Tola's story is that Tola is not the point of Tola's story. You might read this and go, two verses? That's not an entire story. No, that's right, because this story ain't about Tola. He's a tiny little character in an enormous story written by God about God. Not only the book of Judges, not only chapter 10, not only these two verses, but every day of all history and every page of Scripture is all about God. The story includes you and I momentarily for a blip, uh, light a candle, blow it out, and watch the smoke disappear. The psalmist says, that's your life. In the span of history, moving on, I mean, how many billions of people have, have, have inhabited small towns, struggled through life, tended their animals, had children, and died? 
And we just have pottery and a few bits of bone to remind us that an entire civilization used to exist in these ash heaps or in these clay dams or in these fields. I wonder if human history will go long enough. I I don't know. But I wonder if it'll go on long enough and whether our records and internet history will be, will be, will be destroyed good enough for people to, to sort of stumble upon what used to be this city, town, nation of Brisbane. I wonder if they'll even know us. I wonder if you and I will have even that much reputation in the history books. We don't know. But the story of Tola comm- commends us and commands us to not care. Your pay should be enough to know this. We are a part of God's glorious, magnificent story. And we don't get a list, we don't get it, we don't get a mention in the Bible. You know, we're long after the last penman died. We, we don't get it, we don't get in here. We probably won't get a plaque that lasts many generations. You, you and I, you know what our sort of glorious inscription that will be remembered for generations and generations is? Your name, the year you, de- you, bo- you were born, and the year you died. That's your gravestone. That's sort, of, that's sort of the limit to what you and I have. And like, we'll have our, obviously our social media pages will just stand as a glorious uh, emblem of our wonderful achievements and rantings. Of course, yes, there'll be that. We get so little mention in the grand scheme of things. We are but one of eight billion immortal souls on planet Earth right now. And all of us will be dead within a hundred years. And more will take our place. But this point of the story of Tola is that Tola is not the point of his story. His life, like our lives, are all a part of God's God-centered story. So, so that means sometimes your parents die, your grandparents die, your great-grandparents are gone, you die, and, and you might be sort of left with this limbo as you think about death. Can I accomplish everything? Will my life be, be entirely fulfilled and satisfied? And, and how do I leave the ultimate absolute legacy? And the answer is no, no one can, no one does. But we take satisfaction and peace and comfort in that I'm a pilgrim in this age made to walk with my God. His ultimate story will come to a perfect culmination. His ultimate story. I'm just one page in a very long story that God's writing and I don't need to see the end of it. I know that it will be glorious. You and I may not get three chapters in the book of Judges like Gideon, but our days are numbered and our works are Our works, all of our days are numbered. God knows exactly what day out of how many days he's given you. He's given me that we are currently on. And each day the calendar turns and we are one day closer to the day of our expiration on this earth. But all of our works are chronicled, maybe not in the book of Judges. I was like, Tola's works weren't even chronicled in the book of Judges. but They are chronicled in heaven. Back in 1652, there was a plaque produced and stamped, uh, 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 screwed to a chapel wall. Tola's spirit is kind of captured by this tablet. In this old Yorkshire church built in 1652, there is an inscription on the tablet about one Sir Robert Shirley. It says this, in the year 1652, when throughout England all things sacred were either profaned or neglected, this church was built by Sir Robert Shirley, whose special praise it is to have done the best of things in the worst of times and to have hoped them in the most calamitous. That's a good legacy. That's, that's getting into the spirit of what we learn from Toller's story. Maybe a very brief plaque for his very event-filled life. Maybe you and I don't even get a plaque, men. Maybe we don't get a building with our name written upon it. Women, maybe you don't get a book detailing your amazing feats of, 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 of wonderful service to Jesus and motherhood and whatever else. But can it still be said over you on the day that you will die? Will it be able to be said over you? You did the best of things and even the darkest of days like Tola. Could it be said that you were faithful to him, to God who had called you, and then you were buried with your fathers? This is what we need. We need a a generation of tollers. And and Jair then uh, 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 rises up after Tola. Tola had made a good wake. Tola had done good work. And then in chapter 10, verse 3, we read about Jair. 
After him arose Jair the Gileadite. We don't even hear about his father and his grandfather. Not even, not even a worthwhile enough family or name to be accounted in that way. But after the 23 years of Tola, rose up Jair, and he judged Israel 22 years. This is 55 years of good and, as far as we can tell, faithful judging. And he had 30 sons. Let's not conclude what that probably means about his wife number. Maybe there is some gun Israelite woman up in heaven who is annoyed at all of the commentators that keep on saying, obviously he was unfaithful and had many wives when she's pushed out 30. Right? Maybe, maybe she's up there annoyed at the commentators wanting the glory this woman definitely deserves. But probably, I don't know what they fed him back there, but probably this is more than one wife. Now maybe you could argue, well, after the first 15 she passed on to glory, and then he faithfully married the next. Probably not, but nonetheless. So he probably had more than one wife. That's, that's a given. But he had 30 sons, and they rode on 30 ambitious, impressive donkeys. And he had 30 cities called Havoth Jair. That means cities belonging to Jair. He was very... Very creative. To this day they are called that, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Camon. So this is, the, this is what we see of Jair. He was actually mentioned, very likely, uh, he is mentioned in Numbers 32, verse 41. Uh, as, as Moses is giving the land over to uh, different heads of uh, the tribes and uh, Manasseh is going to take this area. And it says, one of the sons of Manasseh, not a direct son, obviously, this is over 300 years later, but one of the sons of Manasseh would then go and take the cities and claim them and name them Havoth Jair. So he was actually quite an influential man. He did a, a, a wonderful enough work that history, as it was written, because the, 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 the numbers was added to very likely slightly later, but it was, he is included then in the account, J.R., the one who took over 30 cities. Now, if we remember the context for the book of Judges, they, all of their failures, all of their wars, the reason they needed judges was because they weren't doing their job as individual tribes. What was their job as individual tribes? Go in, multiply, take over the land, put them to the sword, kick them out. They've sinned against God in this land that he made long enough, get rid of them. So, so here's Jair, we're getting this sort of, this, this idea that he's faithful to the calling of his fathers. He's faithful to the whole national constitution and commission that God had given to Israel as they came into the land. This is, therefore, he's a good guy. That's the, the idea that we're meant to get. And over 30 cities, his, his sons ruled over. This is quite impressive. We read here about the donkeys, and we've, we've learned that his, um, his taking of cities suggest his faith, his obedience. He was leading the whole country, but he was also leading by example in his own home and is in, in, his own, uh, in his own tribe and cities. But it says here that he had 30 sons on 30 donkeys, and you read that and think, how unimpressive, how very poor he must have been. But in these days, this is actually a sign of his wealth and his pomp. Uh, donkeys were kind of, they were the, they were the Ford F-250 of the ancient world. They were uh, utilitarian. They were a ute. Right? They weren't the Maserati horse that you ride through on the highways that are nicely paved. These are the bush-bashing utes that could haul, that could carry a load, and that made loud noises as they passed all the farm girls. This is the, this is the, this is the donkey. So he had the, his family had a fleet of 30 Ford F-250 diesel guzzling utes. That's the kind of, that's like, he's rich, but he's redneck rich. You know what I mean? Like he has an enormous house, but 80% of it is porch and garage. That's the kind of, not a fine china collection, just lots of tires and number plates up on his, up on his garage wall. That's the kind of guy Jair is. So, however, it is shown here that he refused to see his wealth as his, as his alone. Right? He's a wealthy man, but he's judging. And he's utilizing the wealth that his family has for the good of the cities and the good of the nation because what good is wealth in Israel if you're about to be taken over by another nation? What good is wealth in Israel if Israel is going to go to hell and the Philistines are going to come in and take over anyway? So he utilizes what wealth God had given him for the good of the nation. He's included here in this way. But he also died and was buried. 
Jair's life does say something about the, the goodness of Tola's work. We've seen in other sermons in this series that sinfulness and faithlessness of fathers and previous generations makes life a lot harder for those seeking to live godly lives the coming generations. Debts are accrued. Spiritual debts are accrued. Horrible practices are normalized in society. All of these kinds of things happen and it makes the upcoming generation have to fight so much harder, not just against their own sin, but also against the multiplying enemy and the sins of their fathers that have become uh, set in stone around them. Well, that is true, but also, so we see in Jola, in Tola and Jair's life, that faithfulness also begets faithfulness. Tola had inherited an absolute mess of an administration and country, broken in civil war, with the halls of justice spattered with brother blood. And yet, by the time of his 22-year administration ending, Jair is able to come up and have so many children that they can ride in their youths on the hills, and they can populate the country, and they can take over city. And the Philistines or the Midianites are not chasing them down and stealing their trucks or stealing uh, uh, by, by gang warfare, taking the goods off the back of their youths. This is not what is happening. This is a time of peace. They're having many children. They're having campfires. They're singing. They're not in hiding like in Gideon's day, uh, threshing wheat inside a wine cellar. They are stocking up the wine cellar with good wine. There is faith on the rise. There is freedom among God's people, and therefore there is the ability for families to increase. Faith, freedom, family. These are not modern inventions after the Enlightenment for for, uh, uh, Western nations. These are good God-given attributes for people to pursue after. And Tola's faithfulness cleared the path and and backburned much of the rubble and the weeds so that Jair could then come in in his generation 20 years later with his children who are then receiving from him much blessing. So this is a testimony to Tola's faithfulness. We don't have many verses about him, but there's at least 55 years and hundreds of thousands, likely millions of Israelites, benefiting from his leadership. Under Jair, again, it seems to be faithful. There's no idolatry mentioned. There's, there's no conquering worth noting. Maybe nations came in, but they were, they were quickly dealt with, and he lived a long life. He has a long leadership, though a short description. A long legacy. He is dead, but he is not forgotten. This is the life of Jair. Next, we can look at the story, and this is going to take us over to Judges chapter 12 and over in verse 8. This is after the, again, the civil war of Jephthah's day. So they had another dip. After Jephthah, there was Ibzan, verse 8. After him, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. This is going to start off a 25-year period of uh, faithful judging by these uh, minor judges, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. So Ibzan uh, rules for, uh, from Bethlehem. He's judging Israel. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters. That's 60 kids. He didn't have multiple wives. There's an even more amazing woman up in heaven wanting the glory. But let's just numerically guess he had at least three wives. Women, what's reasonable? Like, do we allocate 20 each? 10 each? I don't know. They, but nonetheless, a few wives and lots of kids. 30 sons, 30 daughters. Here's what he did. He gave in marriage... Uh, the 30 daughters he gave in marriage outside his clan and 30 daughters he brought in from outside for his sons and he judged Israel seven years. So this is, this is saying that having 60 children, he, he married his daughters off to his, his, his distant relatives, to the rest of Israel. Israel is not in civil war anymore. They're not stealing each other's wives. They're not pillaging and stealing human beings and and trafficking the women. They are giving in wonderful sort of cross-tribal wedding celebrations and uh, 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 single mingle nights. They are having a tremendous time of of celebration, of, uh, of unity. The nation is doing well. Weddings are on the rise. They are partying, houses are filling, children are bustling everywhere. This is a good sign for, this is a terrible sign for any people, any people group, when children are missing. I hope you come to church and you love at least to the few cries and the coos and the noises. 
right? It says we're growing. It says families are multiplying. It says there's souls that are going to be taking up the mantle in the next generation. It's good. It's detrimental. It's terrible. It's, it's a doom. It's a fate. It's horror for a nation or a people when they don't have lots of kids. They're being outnumbered by somebody. Their goods will be received in inheritance and a will by somebody's children. It will not be their own. It's bad news for a nation when they have an aging population. It was great news for Israel in Ibzan's day when you could afford to have 60 teenagers, maybe not at once. We pray not at once. But at some point, he had, he had teenagers for about 60 years straight if they were all born after each other. However you divide that up, maybe he just had teenagers for 20 years. Anybody's broke in our day on, the, on, that, on that budget, all right? He was going fine. They had weddings. They had parties. They were a unified nation. It was a wonderful time. And he judged Israel for seven years. And then Ibzan died and was buried at Bethlehem. Then Elon arose, verse 11. After him, Elon the Zebulonite judged Israel, and he judged Israel 10 years. Then Elon the Zebulonite died and was buried at Ahijalon, which is another translation of his own name, in the land of Zebulon. 10 good years. What, was he political? Was he military? Was he a preacher and a prophet? We don't know. We don't know, but 10 good years under Elam, after Ibzan. And then we meet Abdon. We get another hint at his countryside riches in verse 13 and 14. After him, Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Periathonite, uh, judged Israel. He had 40 sons. There you go, 40 sons. Still up there, not, not, not 60 kids. We don't hear about the girls. We don't know how many. But he had 40 sons and 30 grandsons. Looks like he had a lot of granddaughters. 40 sons and only 30 boys came out. That's fine. But obviously, uh, uh, he had then seven, a fleet of 70 utes that he shared with his grand... This is three generations of, of F-250s soaring down, down the uh, country road going home. Is the Him, his 40 sons, his 30 grandsons who rode on 70 donkeys and he judged Israel for eight years. Then Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Periathonite, died and was buried at Pirathon in the land of Ephraim in the hill country of the Amalekites. One thing that we pick up as you read in quick succession these short stories is the same kind of spiritual sense or feeling or um, uh, uh, acknowledgement that you might have reading the early chapters of the, book, of the whole Bible or the book of Genesis. There's good days, there's a very bad day, the whole world is cast into sin, that's Genesis 3. Then there's some other good days and Adam has children and, and his children uh, along the godly line, they have more children and they have more children, they're multiplying and they're walking with God. One of them just disappears and is with God no more, all the way down to the generation of the flood. But then there are other sections and this happens in Genesis 5 when, when the... the uh, 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 Descendants are just listed one after another and this constant theme comes up that seems so alien to the world that God had created five chapters before, which was a life of blessedness, perfection, and peace over the whole world. Now, now Genesis 5 is, is writing, uh, he lived so long and he died. He lived so long and then he died. His son lived so long and then he died. It's this constancy of the curse of death. And you get that idea when you read the judges here. They ruled for so long, but died and were buried at Bethlehem. He lived so long and was buried, died and buried at Ahijalon. He lived, he was, but then he died and was buried at Pirathon. Over in chapter 10, we had the same thing. Then he died and was buried at Shamir. Then he died and was buried at Kamon. The constancy of every legacy. The one end to every good or evil ruler and everyone beneath them is that all of us face the certainty of death. Romans 5, not Genesis 5, not Judges 5, but Romans 5 speaks of the theological point of this, that death rules. Judges ruled for 20 years, 40 years, 22 years, 23 years, 8 years, 10 years, 7 years. Good on them for all of their individual points. Do you know how long death reigned? 
From the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden up until his head was destroyed, his crown was stolen and his scepter was broken by Jesus Christ, the great judge. Death reigned. No one beat death. A cute judge came up and death reigned over him. A good king came and death took the throne. An evil king came in and death took the throne. No one is born on this earth that has not met with the final scepter removing their life from them, the reigner of death. Romans 5 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all are sinners. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, before Moses. But sin is not counted where there is no law, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses. Because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. It is so sobering for us to remember and realize that one day all we will be to maybe so, so, so soon as your great-grandchildren. Maybe they'll be named after you and all they know about you is the dash in between the two numbers on your gravestone. How many of us can even tell us, tell, tell, tell somebody to your right or your left, two or three facts about your great-grandparents? Now, how few of us could? They're just lost to history. They're so long ago. You will be taught these days to think of them as bigots and horrible human beings because they did not adhere to our modern leftist uh, 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 sensibilities and values, which are not values nonetheless. We just completely forgot. You and I will be there one day. We will be a distant memory. Maybe, maybe you'll get your name as one of your great-grandkids' middle names. But you will be forgotten. Just as maybe you're named after your great-great-grandparent, who may have done wonderful things and saved the family line and, and, and kept his, his children alive through harsh winters and a terrible depression or even a war but we just forget about the past so quickly. And it's this somber realization and memory coming upon us now to remind us that all of us will one day die. The young and our youth and our fitness and our beginning our careers and starting our families, soon to be married, recently married, hoping to be married, all of us will die. And it does us good to remember that. The day of our death has been set from eternity past and every day we get closer to it and it doesn't budge. We are closer to it than we were yesterday. The place of your death, where you breathe your last, is set. I wonder if you've been where you will be the last time. I wonder if God could show you right now where you will die, if it'll be a familiar place to you. Maybe it'll be in a country you've never been to, but somewhere out there in the world is marked with a flag that only God sees, the place that you and I, each of us, will die. We will be buried somewhere. Maybe family will scatter our ashes somewhere, and then we will be, before long, despite the best efforts of our children or chroniclers or biographers or those who loved you, we will be forgotten. This is the reality of death over the human race. This is what, at least in part, what these stories remind us. The question, the most important question over every single one of us is, when that day of death comes, when that place of your death is inhabited by you for the last time, will you in that moment be reconciled to the God you're about to go and give an account to? Will you, will you pass through death as, as if one being chauffeured to the throne room of God? Or will you go through death as one being grabbed by the prison guards and thrown into the cell for your condemnation? What, what will be your relationship to God on that day? It must be one of reconciliation in and through. The only way we can be reconciled and have forgiveness, Jesus Christ. Be reconciled to God. But, but then those who are, that's only the, a part of our story. Then also the question has to be, what will be left behind at least for the por portions of time that people will remember you? And what will be left behind in the chronicles of heaven for people that you've never met yet, that may not exist yet, and angels beyond number to give glory to God for in your life. 
See, our lives are not just to be lived amongst here where we'll pass away and be forgotten and it'll all be wrapped up like a scroll and thrown in the trash heap, giving way to the recreation of the new world. That's, that's not all our life is. This life is lived in such a way to write glorious things on the chronicles of heaven so that for endless ages, we can keep on coming back to them and saying, can I tell you what God did in and through the life of this sinner? Can I tell you another story? Can we give glory to God again because he did this? We conquered that kingdom. These things were put down. Great glory to God was given in this way. We gave this. We served then. We accomplished that. Glory to God. That's what our life is meant to do. Write tremendous stories on the chronicles of heaven by God's grace and God's grace alone. Will that be the life that you live as you near into death? There are nobodies in this book that we are meant to learn from. But I just wanna, if we can step out of the book of Judges for, for a couple of minutes, within the timeline of Judges, there's an even bigger nobody. There's, there's, there's actually a family of even bigger nobodies than the ones we've read here today. They weren't even judges. They were hardly leaders in cities. All we know is that they were, well, we, they had names. One man was a single a uh, small business owner. He owned a small ranch, a family-owned ranch. His name was Boaz, Boaz Farms. And then there was a woman who was actually a Moabite, a widowed Moabite, a childless, widowed Moabite who didn't really belong among the Israelite people except that her bitter mother-in-law allowed her to come back into Israel when she moved back from Moab. They're all losers in this story so far. Boaz was not a winner. He was not a military leader. He was not, he was not even married. It was like 60, 60 girls getting born in the next farm over. He couldn't get one of them. Right? He's not a ladies' man, this Boaz. He's a hard worker. He's got a bunch of dudes working for him on his farm and, and many servant girls. Good on him. No wife. Right? He just didn't have the gift of the gab. No riz, they would say these days. And here he is. Here he is. He sees come back into town another woman who, for all intents and purposes, is a nobody. She married a nobody and he took her off into Moab to go and live there because times were hard in Israel. Bad move, bad move, bad move. It looks mathematic like it was probably in the days of Deborah or in the days of Gideon that uh, 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 Ruth's mother-in-law, husband, uh, took them over. Ruth was a Moabite, got married. Again, we remember <laughs> Ruth shouldn't exist. Moabites shouldn't exist. First of all, because they're a result of horrible incest a few generations back. But also, secondly, because the Israelites were supposed to kill them all. So, so why does she exist? Well, she does. And by God's grace, she moves back into Israel. Now, this is a pretty messed up small town story. Lots of drama and gossip going on at the uh, well and at the pub as they walk back into town. But Boaz, and this is just this beautiful G-rated fairy tale that sort of happens within the R-rated context of Judges. It's this beautiful romantic story of nobody's meeting on an underpaid job as Ruth was working the fields. Boaz takes a liking to her. He asks about her. Then he starts giving her free things. Women, if he's buying you stuff, he may be terrible at talking. He wants to take you on a date, right? That's, that's what he's doing. Uh, he starts uh, giving her food and gifts and flowers. And, and eventually they end up getting married. And so you've got these diamond-studded utes tearing through town. You've got these influential, wealthy families ruling the nation and, 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 and uh, keeping the nation safe and praise God for them. They're, they're sort of recounted to us as, as kind of nobodies compared to the bigger characters of Judges. But then even in the backwaters of those stories, there's even bigger nobodies, Ruth and Boaz. Now my question for you is, of which line did the king come? Who's the grandfather? Who's the great-grandfather of the greatest king Israel will ever know? Is it Ibzan? Is it Elon? Is it uh, 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 Jer? Is it Tola? Is it uh, Abdon with all of his, his grandsons and all of his donkeys? No. No, it's widowed, childless, Ruth, marrying, kind of old, single, farmer, Boaz, married, now, the Gentile blood in this family is pretty strong. Boaz's mother was in the land of Canaan. In fact, Boaz's mother was the hooker that the Israelite spies saved in the destruction of Canaan. When the spies came in, they spoke. They were helped by who? Boaz's mum. Boaz was half Gentile. He marries a Gentile. Their kid is like three quarters Gentile, and he's the grandfather. 
He's the grandfather of David the king. Amongst all of the, even amongst the nobodies, God digs even deeper and says, I think there's an even worse family out there (laughs) than this. And from them, I will redeem Israel. From them, I will get my glory and bring about a king. But of course, this is also not just how God is telling the story of the whole Bible in and through this chapter in the book of Judges, which is that he's preparing the way secretly without even a mention in the book of Judges for the king to come. But it also points us to somebody, maybe the only person, who's a bigger nobody than everybody we've looked at in the book of Judges so far. And that is a young man named Joshua, who was born in or around the year 0 BC. He, he becomes the C of the AD, BC deal, right? Joshua, or in English, we call him Jesus. And he's born with a crazy family reputation. Yes, his uncle-in-law is the high priest, but his cousin is a locust-eating city abstainer desert boy, John the Baptist. Jesus is very poor in a poor family. Oh, but who's his mother's? You know, when we, when we read the genealogy of Jesus, do we get the, the son of this man, the son of this man? Well, his mum was an impoverished teenager who got pregnant out of wedlock, not through sin. Nonetheless, she was pregnant before she was married. All of the shame, possibly gossiping around her involved with that, but, but then married as a virgin, giving birth to Joshua, or in English, Jesus. And then all the stories, all the miracles, all of the powerful 30 years of Jesus' life that we hear about, right? He's a nobody. He cracks onto the scene, and it seems that he has to introduce himself to people. Is this Joseph's son? The hammer swinger? The carpenter? From old, from, from up north? I can't even remember the name of it. It's, I think it's, it's after exit 33. Like, you don't go there. You, go, you get out of your car, you'll come back, your tires will be stolen. This is Joshua, and he's here trying to tell us that he's one with the father. This man's a nobody. Who's his fa- where's his father? Well, his father's likely dead by the time Jesus is a teenager. Huh. And who's his mum? Oh, I did hear that story. Oh, the old angel told me so story. Yeah, okay. He's in a family that is surrounded by shame, that is very poor, He is rejected by his family, largely in his ministry. 30 years, he's unknown. He's only got three short years of judging Israel. And we can see him as the last judge that arises to teach and preach and bring back the glory of Moses and Abraham and all things prophesied. We can see Jesus in that fashion. And he does, he does ride a donkey, doesn't he? He doesn't have a fleet. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't even have one donkey. He's that poor. He doesn't even have like an old 1984 rust bucket Hilux that can work if it's going downhill to ride into Jerusalem, the city that is supposed to be his ruling place. No, he has to, he has to send one of his mates into town, ask Uncle, Uncle John, can we borrow one of his donkeys? And they, and they bring it out and he borrows a car for the afternoon in order to ride into Jerusalem as its coming king. This is Jesus. Out of obscurity comes the king. A nobody in the eyes of the world with plenty of jokes to be able to be made about him in blasphemy, died naked on a cross under the destruction, the execution and the torture device of the cross that the Romans had had perfected. He dies with no lineage. He has billions of children. He dies with no land, and the great most expansive kingdom ever known to man. He dies, he, he, he still has no grave for us to go and visit. Not even a gravestone, because he defeated death and put it to death. The reign of death was ended the day the reign of Jesus began. And his reign began the day that he exploded out of the grave and that he was given the inheritance of all the nations, the inheritance of the world, so that all those who were held in fear and lifelong slavery to death could be rescued, could be freed, and could be brought home into his father's kingdom by nothing less and nothing more than faith in his name. So much power exists in his judgment, so much glory in what he accomplished in his tiny three-year judging of Israel and the world as he judged Satan and threw out the ruler 
of the world. So powerful is his work and his ministry and what he did in those short years that all you and I have to do is just call on his name. Now, this is not vending machine theology. Say his name, cross your fingers, pray a couple of recited prayers, and you'll get forgiveness. This is genuine. Leave everything behind. Embrace Christ. Call on him desperately with the cry that he would destroy the enemies of your soul, that he would strip you of the sins that hold you down, that you would would be freed of the addictive afflictions and affections towards evil. If you call on Jesus to give you a new heart, to be your judge, your Lord, your Savior, then his cross, death, and his resurrection will cover you. You'll be freed of sins, freed of death, and brought into God's family. Jesus never raised a sword against one of the earthly enemies, and yet he defeated our greatest enemy, sin, sin, death, and hell. Let's worship him now in prayer. Father God, we pray that in this moment you would smile upon the work of your son, not for our sake. There are are unconverted people in our midst tonight, and they, they cannot call on you and demand that you save them or rescue them yet again. They have no reason, like the Israelites, They have no reason to be able to bank on you giving them even an extra day to live. Their time could be done before we sing the amen. Yet, Lord God, would you look on your son, Jesus Christ, and for his sake, pardon them. For his sake at your right hand, would you look on those here present and give them grace and mercy and new life and a new heart. Would you, Lord God, please give your Holy Spirit so that they can enliven place their faith in Jesus and embrace him as the rescuer of their soul, as the destroyer of their sin and as the defeater of their death. Would you, Lord God, give them the ability to be saved right now. For those of us who belong to you, Lord God, we are in covenant with you, we are obligated to you, and we ask that though we may not be remembered, no one will know our name, though we are not in it for our own glory, may all glory be to Christ. Would you do wonderful glorious, amazing things in and through these sinners who resign themselves over to you and your power. Please do wonderful things. Get glory for yourself in this day and in this age through this church and these people. And they all said together,